All right, hello there, comrades. If you can hear me, please uh, write in the chat and let me know if there's any problems with the audio as well. The uh, internet connection here isn't the best. Uh, I'm actually in St. Petersburg right now and I'm doing a live with my laptop. Uh, I was sent here on a business trip to, uh, to cover some events that are going to be connected to the anniversary of the uh, Leningrad blockade. So, um, But still, I wanted to you know, do this live stream so I could give you guys my analysis of, of, of um, Alexander Dugan's, not Vladimir Dugan's, <laughs> Alexander Dugan's ideas. All right, cool. Looks like the audio is good. Great. Thanks for the uh, the beard compliment. <laughs> yeah, I decided I'd grow growing a beard and uh, following the footsteps of our our great philosophical predecessors, Marx, Engels, uh, Lenin, and uh, well, Stalin didn't have a beard, but he had a good mustache. Uh, so yeah. I'm gonna let the uh, the live stream go just another five minutes because it is scheduled for um, 9.30, so I'm just gonna let some people come in and uh, yeah, and then we'll get started basically on, uh, at 9.30 sharp. But uh, Ben, where was I born? I was born in New Jersey actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised in Jersey. I'm a Jersey boy, if you can believe that. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you all here. Thanks for joining me on the live stream. Looks like we've got 16 people here so far. Hopefully more are going to come in in just about five minutes. Oh uh, yeah, Chris, you made it to a live. <laughs> I guess you, you, you miss them a lot of the time. No way, Zal Jork, you're a you're a Jersey boy too. Where are you from in Jersey? I, I'm from East Brunswick in Central Jersey. <laughs> Pointy beard one, yeah. I, I want to get the uh, like Dzerzhinsky facial hair to be honest. I want to get like a mustache like that goes out to here with the pointy beard but uh, my fiance says she doesn't want me to do it so I <laughs> gotta, gotta compromise. Oh wow, Bergen County. Wow. It's so crazy how many people that are like uh, fans of the channel are, are so close to my hometown. Like uh, we, have, we have one fan uh, named Enrique actually who's in Moscow and helped me film the uh, video we did on Soviet New Year's and he he's from he's from Central Jersey he's like his hometown is like 20 minutes drive away from mine it's crazy how small the world is yeah guys so as uh, more people come in to this live stream I see 21 people are here already uh, just to give everyone a rundown or a preview of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, this live stream is going to be focused around the interview that we did with Alexander Dugan. Now, if you haven't seen that full interview, or if you've, uh, if if you haven't even seen parts of it, the link I put in the chat. It's the first message there. It says link to our full interview with Alexander Dugan. Please uh, watch that after you watch the live stream, so you can understand. Uh, the kind of stuff I'm going to be referencing because, frankly, I've read some of Alexander Dugan's uh, stuff, uh, but only parts of uh, some of his books. So uh, I'm going to say this again when we get the live stream started, but I'm no expert on Dugan. I'm going to be focusing uh, mainly on what he spoke about during the interview and with reference to some other stuff I've picked up here and there um, before we did this interview, some of the things I've read about it. But uh, I do plan on reading more. 
about uh, Dugan's works, and I asked some people who are fans of the channel now, who are, you know, Dugan supporters, to send me some materials, so I'm definitely looking forward to reading about that. Uh, yeah, I've heard of Infrared. Yeah. Actually, I, I follow his, uh, his Telegram channel. <clears throat> so, yeah. That's right, Jersey Squad. Can I put on some background music? Um, unfortunately, it's going to be really hard for me to do it here because I'm in a hotel and I don't have any, like, uh, sound system, and it, I think it's gonna mess up the, um, the, the audio with it. And also another thing is that when I was putting background music in the live streams before, it was, like, just for, like, 30 seconds of a song. Maybe it had some, maybe someone had copywritten it. It was, it was taking away all, all sort of, um, funding that was, uh, coming in from the video just because of, like, 30 seconds of a song at the beginning, so. I'm a little uh, apprehensive about putting songs now. <sighs> but anyway, uh, yeah, so we've just got a minute uh, before the actual start time. I'm gonna go ahead and start. We've got 22 people watching now. I'm sure some more people will uh, file in as we uh, continue. So uh, first of all, I just wanna mention, uh, again, for anyone who's just come in here, I'm doing this live stream with hotel Wi-Fi in St. Petersburg, so it's not going to be necessarily the highest quality uh, like we usually have when I'm able to do it in, in my apartment with better Wi-Fi, but we're going to do the best we can, and I'm hoping it's not going to cut out, but so far it looks like uh, the uh, connection is fine. So welcome to the live stream, comrades, of the Revolution Report covering the ideas of Alexander Dugan that were expressed in the interview we did with him, which can be found on the channel. I'm going to say once again, I said a few m minutes earlier, but just so anyone who just uh, filed in understands, this video is going to be covering mainly the ideas that Alexander Dugan expresses in the interview we did with him on the channel. That can be found in the chat right now. I put the link in the, it's the first message that says link to our full interview with Alexander Dugan. So if you haven't watched the full thing or you haven't uh, watched it at all, I highly suggest you watching that interview after this live stream so you can get an understanding of, uh, of what exactly I'm talking about here. Because uh, I want to also reiterate, I'm not like a, an expert on Alexander Dugan and I don't know all of his ideas. Uh, I've read a, a bit here and there. I've ta I've written, I've I've read parts of different uh, books that he's written in Russian. Here I I was able to get my hands on them, but uh, I'm far from an, an expert, and I'm going to focus mostly on the kind of uh, content that was covered in the interview. So, another thing uh, I want to say is that. Uh, you know, a lot, there, there were some people that were a little triggered that I decided to do an interview with uh, Alexander Dugan on the channel, and I just want to let you know that uh, um, the way I see it is that I think it's important for everyone to hear his point of view and uh, his, his views, and I think it's important that we uh, critically analyze them, because for one, the Western media has been trying to make him out to be a fascist ever since the beginning of... Uh, the Russia special military operation in Ukraine and before that, but obviously it was after that that they really started trying to bring the hammer down on him. And there's good reason for that, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it's connected to the fact that uh, Alexander Dugin actually lent a lot of support to the Lugansk and the Donetsk People's Republics right after they declared independence from uh, the fascist-backed coup in Ukraine. So uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about that later, but uh, I think it's really important we hear his uh, point of view because of that. I also think it's important because um, he's got a lot of good ideas. It's a lot I don't agree with, a lot I do agree with, but he's definitely not a fascist, which a lot of people in the West are trying to make him out to be. So without further ado, I'm going to be covering um, several of the main uh, topics, I guess you could say, that uh, we could cover in relation to this interview. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about uh, the origins of national Bolshevism in Russia, 
which was uh, the idea, which which was the ideology of the party that Alexander Dugin used to be a part of. He's not anymore, though. So I can't say that uh, national Bolshevism is, uh, you know, part of his ideology. But I I, I personally believe that it may have in influenced it. But I would say neo Eurasianism, which is also something we're going to be talking about, is uh, a better descriptor for uh, what Alexander Dugin believes in. And then we're going to draw some conclusions about what it should mean for. Marxist-Leninists, and in in relation to you know people who are like hardline Alexander Dugin supporters. So the first thing I want to talk about is the <clears throat> philosophical starting point, uh, because obviously that's really where we need to start any analysis. Like, what is the uh, starting point f from where where we begin our analysis? And this is probably one of the the biggest contradictions between. Um, Duganist thought, I guess you could say, and Marxist-Leninist thought, because uh, the clearest contradiction between the two is that um, Alexander Dugin is, uh, uh, he believes in metaphysics. His, his analysis is, ba is metaphysical, and a Marxist-Leninist analysis uh, is based in materialism. You know, we are dialectical materialists. Uh, for those of you who don't know what uh, what metaphysics is, I mean, it's hard to explain it uh, in one sentence, basically. But I could, I think, it could be aptly described as the opposite of materialism. Material dialectical materialism says that matter is, uh, you know, above consciousness. Uh, it's it comes before consciousness. Matter was there before any sort of human interaction or society, and so we have to consider matter before mind, I guess you could say. Metaphysics uh, is basically the opposite of that, saying that, uh, you know, that, that consciousness, that the mind comes before matter. So this is like a, a very big simplification of the difference, but it's a very critical one, because the starting point for all uh, further philosophical analyses uh, that, you know, we make as either materialists or metaphys metaphysicians. So uh, this is the big contradiction between, you know, th th this, is, this is how Leninist ideas and Duganist ideas are incompatible. One is metaphysical, one is uh, material. These are basically dialectical antitheses. And uh, one of the criticisms I'm gonna bring up right now is that uh, this metaphysical starting point that Dugan has leads him to some bad conclusions uh, that, I, that I think are, are incorrect. Um, the first one, and referencing the interview we did, is about the Soviet, is talking about the Soviet Union as a continuation of the Russian Empire. Um, although he did, you know, he didn't say that uh, they weren't ideological antitheses of each other. He did say that. Uh, but to talk about it this way, um, you know, is it actually, in a way, echoes Western propaganda against Russia because, uh, you know, propagandists and uh, Western imperialists like, I don't know, like Michael McFowl and these so-called Russia experts in the West that uh, are constantly making propaganda against the Soviet Union, their narrative is that the Soviet Union was an empire, which as a Marxist-Leninist, we don't believe that. We believe it was anti-imperialist and that the United States was an, was an empire. And the reason we have... Um, the, re the reason why a Marxist-Leninist would not char characterize the Soviet Union as, a, as an empire and a Duganist might ca uh, characterize it as, you know, connected to the Russian Empire somehow is because the materialist looks at imperialism through the uh, Marxist-Leninist understanding of the term, which is, which is primarily based on economics. So the reason why um, the, our whole understanding of imperialism uh, comes from the way the capitalist system essentially enslaves I its periphery and makes uh, basically underdeveloped countries dependent on the core imperialist countries, i.e. the West, and puts them into a system of uh, perpetual underdevelopment and dependence on manufactured goods from uh, the West. And they become basically mines of raw resources for the uh, West's exploitation. This was not the case in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union did not exploit its periphery. I guess you could, uh, if you want to call it a periphery, because this is more of a term that only actually applies to empires, but 
we could talk about like you know the the Russian um, the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic's relationship to its outline the the other republics in the Soviet Union. These republics actually saw economic development. They actually saw um, cultural development. They saw social development. You know, a lot of these places were basically brought out of the Stone Age, like uh, Tajikistan, for example, which had no sort of industry before. Uh, it became a communist country before it became a Soviet Republic. The Soviet Union industrialized the country and actually created some sort of independent industrial economic life for the people there, which were before living in uh, completely agrarian conditions and living a lifestyle that was not too different from, you know, Taj Tajik life in the 1500s. So that's a, a huge difference. And, that, and the reason why we, as materialists, see the Soviet Union as something completely different from the Russian Empire is because we look at it that way. It's, it was economically completely different from the Russian Empire. Now the reason people uh, who subscribe to Dugan's train of thought don't see it that way is because they, their starting point is from that of a metaphysical one. They, uh, and my understanding of why uh, they see uh, the Soviet Union as a continuation of the Russian Empire is because it's uh, they, they see history of the history of Russia as a sort of um, like a continuum that doesn't that doesn't have to do with uh, the struggle of economic forces. So because so like for example, Russia had a, the Russian Empire at one point had a strong state that uh, protected the uh, interests of the national bourgeoisie and the uh, national feudal class of the Russian Empire. When the Russian Empire fell, the Soviet Union appeared, but then the Soviet Union was able to establish its own strong state, and it also, you know, defended the country against uh, foreign intervention throughout the Civil War. It was victorious, and it also built a strong state and ultimately defended the uh, national interests of the Russian people as well. So I'm, I'm thinking this is why the, the Duganists... Um, see it this way, as the Soviet Union was a continuation of the Russian Empire, because it's not, the economic aspect is not taken into account at the, at the forefront of the analysis. So this is obviously uh, something I don't think is very good. And like I said, um, this is why, um, th this is why Duganists basically have at least come to that conclusion that echoes what the West says, that the Soviet Union was an empire. So I don't really find that very compatible. But um, he do really, like Alexander Dugan doesn't focus that much on economics in terms of when he's, uh, or, or that much about how the Soviet Union is the continuation of the Russian Empire. Mostly he's uh, talking about traditionalism. His, I, I feel like his, his main focus is about this um, dichotomy and this uh, contradiction between in, in the world right now between traditionalism and I guess you could say like Western liberal degeneracy, um, and this is a this is a, a sphere where I don't think that tr that Duganism and Marxism Leninism are incompatible uh, when it comes to traditionalism, <clears throat> because um, if you look. At, and this is also a reason why actually Duganists look at uh, Stalin and Lenin and, uh, you know, like the early Bolsheviks, many of them, as a positive uh, historical force. They look positively among these, along, uh, upon these uh, historical communist historical figures, even though they don't agree with communism. Um, this, <clears throat> they're not incompatible because if we look outside of the sphere of basically Western leftism, uh, which has really developed in, in a bubble, actually, now that, uh, now that I've, I've been able to leave the country and meet other communists from the, around the world, I've realized that this is the case. Most other communist parties in the world are, tr are traditionalist, basically, by the standards of uh, what Dugan is saying. I mean, it, it's obviously to varying degrees, but, uh, you know, in Russia, you have the, the KPRF, which has embraced traditional values. They supported the, um, they supported the bill against uh, anti-LGBT propaganda, which, um, you know, is, is a lot more complicated than a lot of people make it out to be um, in, in the West, you know, because obviously if something like that was passed in the West, 
it would be, uh, you know, obviously pretty horrific. But in Russia, the, the problem is that like these, it, it is specifically connected to LGBT issues. Uh, almost all of it, all, almost all of the political activism and uh, propaganda connected to LGBT issues is shipped in from the West. And it's, and it's usually used as a vehicle, not just for, uh, you know, fighting for gay rights or anything like that, but to establish regime change. You know, if they, the, the, people, the people that are pushing this narrative, and not just Russia, but also in other um, anti-imperialist countries, they're basically using it to say, you know, we got to overthrow the government so that uh, we, we can have LGBT rights. You know, they're using it as, they're using this political issue as a vehicle to bring in liberal capitalist ideas, which is why we see, uh, we've seen in Russia, the KPRF supporting something uh, like that in terms of, um, in terms of laws in the state Duma. But Russia is not the only example. You also have uh, the Chinese Communist Party, which has embraced Confucianism and is extremely traditional. Um, in North Korea, it's the same thing. The, um, the, North, the North Korean, the Korean Workers Party is super traditional. Uh, I mean, in Latin America, that's the, that's the case in, in a lot of places as well, but obviously recently we saw uh, Cuba embrace a little bit uh, of a different thing. But my point is that traditionalism is not exclusive to the right. And uh, this, is, this, is, this has been made clear by the activity of uh, leftist parties in other places of the world, and you know, I think uh, I think this is this is why there's a bit of an attraction of uh, people who support Dugan's line of thought to communist figures in general, because typically, you know, Lenin, Stalin, they were also in in terms of uh, the cultural sphere quite traditional. You can read about like the disagreements that, for example, Lenin and Kolontai had over cultural issues. So this is, this is an area that uh, Dukin really focuses on that I don't think is incompatible with Marxism-Leninism. Um, but we could talk about that later. I, I'm also going to want to answer some of your questions. We, I'll take them in the chat right now. Uh, not right now, but at the end of the stream, I will uh, take some questions and answer them. But that basically covers the stuff I wanted to talk about in terms of the starting point of philosophical analysis, the main contradiction between looking at uh, the world through a materialist viewpoint and a metaphysical viewpoint. The, the second thing I want to talk about is uh, the end of modernity, as Dugan calls it, because if you remember from the interview that I did with him, he's talking, uh, D Alexander Dugan talks about the end of modernity, and he might not be a materialist, but the way he talks about modernity and his relationship to it is certainly dialectical that's for sure it might not be materialist but it is dialectical because he talks he, he's bringing attention to the fact that uh, to a fact that uh, you know many people probably have not even ever thought about that modernity is temporary you know um and it's dialectical because uh, you know, anyone anyone who subscribes to the dialectic understands that everything has a beginning and everything has an end. Modernity had a beginning in the Enlightenment, obviously, and it's going to have an end someday. Now, the question is, how is it going to end and un under what conditions? So Dugan says that uh, modernity is likely going to come to an end with the birth of a multipolar world. Um, and that uh, he also said Ukraine is the first multipolar conflict. So this is uh, Dugan's position on that. And the kind of, uh, the kind of post, well, not, I guess not postmodern, but the, the, uh, the kind of post-modernity world that he sees is one uh, in which uh, every nation defines its own um, national reality, basically, outside of the universal um, ideas of the Enlightenment, like uh, the universal ideas of human rights, un universal ideas of democracy, and yada, yada, yada. Um, so in terms of modernity coming to an end, uh, I, de I definitely uh, agree with, uh, with Alexander Dugan here. I think modernity is going to come to an end, is, is going to come to an end. And um, 
Uh, I wanted to say something else on that. It, it is going to come to an ah yeah, and also this uh, I wanted to mention that this concept of postmodernity that we have right now, um, I personally don't think it's different from modernity. I think uh, post postmodernity is uh, a consequence basically of liberalism's uh, victory in the Cold War, and uh, because I think the Cold War could have been potentially an end, it could have led to the end of modernity because I really think that the end of modernity is going to come in one of two ways. Uh, and this is where I probably disagree with Dugan. Uh, socialism or barbarism, basically. I mean, modernity will either end progressively or regressively. I think if it, if it ends progressively, we're going to see you know, socialism established across the planet, and then when humanity is able to take the step into superabundance and become uh, a global communist society, that's going to mark the end of modernity. Or, you know, it can go backwards into barbarism, where we were not able to achieve that, and the world, I mean, the, the capital, the neoliberal capitalist system just continues to intensify its exploitation of us, to the point where uh, we're going to see the development of fascism, specifically in the imperialist core, or we're just going to get uh, destroyed by war and uh, climate change. But I hope that's not uh, that's not the case. Uh, but this is my this is my understanding as a Marxist-Leninist of the two possible ways we can see the end of modernity. Um, I don't think uh, Dugan sees it that way, but uh, I I really do find his um, his drawing attention to the fact that modernity is mortal and we should think about that, I think that's uh, that's pretty profound and we should and it's an interesting thing to talk about. Now, so that's uh, that's all I wanted to say about the end of modernity and the, uh, about the fact that uh, you know Dugan has come to this conclusion about modernity. I think because he thinks dialectically, although not maybe not uh, as a materialist, but uh, dialectically, I think he does, and that's you know obviously in large part because of the fact that uh, he I, th I think he grew up in the you know the Soviet education system because his uh, way of thinking, even though it's not communist, I think is uh, something that wouldn't really have been able to be produced from the West from a Western education system where people you know don't even under understand dialectical way of ways of thinking. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this concept of Marxism being a dogma. Because Alexander Dugan says this in uh, the interview that we did with him, that we did with him. And to I think I think we have to be careful in uh, understanding and and, I, and this is just my idea of it. I, I can't speak for Alexander Dugan, but this is my interpretation of what he said. I think we have to be very careful in uh, in terms of understanding what he meant, because um, Alexander Dugan says Marxism is a dogma, but most of the time he's talk he says um, Soviet Soviet dogmatism when he's when he talks about uh, when he talks about uh, the, this dogmatic I, this allegedly dogmatic ideology. He doesn't say socialist dogma. Uh, I think the reason why he finds specifically Soviet ideology dogmatic is because of the time period in which he lived. We have to remember that uh, like he grew up in the late Soviet period where I would say, and as a Marxist-Leninist, like the, the, ide the ideology, the reigning ideology in the Soviet Union at that time was dogmatic. It hadn't been updated basically since the times of Lenin or Stalin. After after Stalin died, basically political economy and um, you know Marxist-Leninist ideology in the Soviet Union was was not really developed significantly at all. It was uh, basically regurgitated in different ways, um, and obviously after de-Stalinization, there was a lot less emphasis on uh, what Stalin wrote. But that but it still uh, stayed. And the, the actual writings of Stalin uh, stayed within the Soviet discourse of uh, Marxism-Leninism as well. And this this actually was a huge problem because it, it created a society in which, you know, throughout the late late 1960s, 1970s, and uh, 1980s before Gorbachev, uh, the Soviet Union, like economically, generally was doing fine, and obviously socialism was a, a powerful force in the world, but. 
the internal situation of the Soviet Union was becoming very demoralizing because the, the slogans and the things that were being said by the authorities and the propaganda that was, making, that was being made was in near 100% contradiction with the, the, the reality of the situation. Um, you know, the authorities were saying we're going to be in communism in 30 years, like, and then 30 years came and everyone was like, where's the communism? You know, the, the, in the Brezhnev period, they said that uh, they had like fully developed socialism, but although the Soviet Union had made great gains, it still had a lot of work to do. And the authorities were saying everything's fine and, and basically not giving any attention to the actual problems that there were in, in Soviet society that needed to be fixed. Uh, the, the law, I mean, the reasoning for that obviously was the authorities didn't want to rock the boat, but it essentially created a, um, a rip between reality and what the, and, and what the, what the party was saying. And, you know, consequently, uh, it led to, uh, um, a schism between the party itself and the people. And that's what led a lot of people to feel like, uh, you know, socialism was a dogma. Although I really think it's uh, it has to do with the specific period they were living in. Um, there's also and 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 this this dogma of the late Soviet period has even really spread itself into our current day as well. I mean, uh, which I think is why uh, why we really don't have that much success in leftist groups anywhere where communist parties are not in power, you know. Um, we also have not really developed Marxism-Leninism as a, as a science since the days of basically Stalin. And uh, that, that's, I think that's a, a big task of our, of our generation. That's something we need to do. Um, I see on the internet people talking about like uh, the immortal science of Marxism-Leninism. I, I mean, I hope, I hope they're just like, uh, you know, chess beating or whatever. But if they're being serious, that's antithetical to the ideas of Marxism-Leninism. There is no such thing as an immortal theory. Not, even Engels said that the dialectic itself is not immortal. Although obviously it's going to outlive most, mostly everything, but, but everything has a beginning and an end and everything is in constant change. So what we should re really be doing is using the dialectical method that Lenin and Stalin used to come to their conclusions of that time, but apply it to our current uh, circumstances, not try to copy and paste the conclusions that they made in very specific historical circumstances and use them in our current uh, situation. This, this, is, this is what people have done since uh, the 1960s and up, and up until now, and that's, that's what leads to dogmatism. That's what leads to the transformation of what was a scientific theory into something that has become, uh, you know, like a, a godless religion, unfortunately. And that's, uh, I think, something that needs to be changed. But this is why, uh, you know, Dugan calls it a dogma, I think, uh, although it shouldn't be a dogma because uh, dialectical materialism is, you know, supposed to be a science. But for me, this understanding of it being a dogma comes down to the way it's been used uh, by communists around the world for, for a very long time. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that um, Dugan also says that China, as a communist country, successfully uh, met the challenges that were required so that it wouldn't face a, uh, a uh, you know, a catastrophic collapse of the state like the Soviet Union did. And he said that um, that this was that that fall, that collapse was in part because of Soviet dogmatism. So I guess inadvertently, he's kind of admitting that, you know, Chinese, Chinese communists overcame dogmatism with the way they um, with the way they adapted to their material conditions. And, you know, if you look at China right now, you know, they even have something that's called Xi Jinping thought, you know, Xi Jinping using what he learned from other leaders in the past to create his own dialectical, you know, analysis of current conditions and expand upon communist uh, China, you know, um, socialism with Chinese characteristics in his own country. That's what we need to do in every other country in the world. And that's what stops uh, this, a science from becoming a dogma. Um, so, yeah, so that's uh, basically uh, every, everything I wanted to talk about in terms of what I agree with and what I disagree with. Um, 
in this interview with Alexander Dugan. So uh, before we go into the questions, like I said at the beginning of the video, I wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of national Bolshevism, which uh, again, like I said at the beginning of the video, Alexander Dugan used to be a member of the National Bolshevik Party, but he's not anymore. And I, I don't I don't think it's fair to say he's a national Bolshevik, but I think it is fair to say that national Bolshevism influenced uh, his ideas. And uh, but right now, neo-Eurasianism, I think, would be a better description for his uh, views. But I want to do this because a lot of people say that like national Bolshevism is just uh, like fascism in the West. Um, I don't subscribe to national Bolshevism. I'm not a national Bolshevik, but it doesn't actually come from, it doesn't have fascist origins. It has origins in the, um, in, 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 in the Russian case specifically, it has origins in the, uh, diaspora, the, the white diaspora that left the Soviet, that left Russia after the Bolsheviks took power and created the Soviet Union. Um, this tendency of, uh, that, uh, of, of national Bolshevism in Russia began with a uh, group that were called the Smenovichovtsi. They were a faction of this uh, white diaspora at th that uh, that came up that came about during basically towards the end of the Civil War, and they were like, "Listen, the the whites are going to lose the Civil War. There's no there's no use uh, fighting on anymore," and we should support the Soviet government because, okay, we don't agree with the fact that they're communists, but they defended Russia and the former Russian imperial sphere from all foreign threats. They won the civil war and they kicked out all of the foreign imperialists and they're building a strong state. So, you know, they came to the conclusion that if they were to continue to fight the Bolsheviks, they would only... Uh, it would only lead to the uh, weakening of the state if they were successful, which is not what they wanted to do. They would, they believed that that would weaken the national sovereignty of Russia. So this faction, they were, they decided to begin to support the Soviet government, and they were actually shunned by the conservative, anti-Bolshevik whites in exile. They even called them. Uh, they even said that they were collaborating with the NKV, NKVD. Because a lot of what the NKV, the, a lot of the ideas that the NKVD wanted to uh, spread throughout the uh, white diaspora, this group of uh, white emigres were spreading them themselves. They came out with a newspaper called Nakanunya, which means on the eve. And that newspaper, even though it wasn't communist, it was funded by the Soviet government. It was subsidized by the Soviet government, a white emigre newspaper. So this, this is actually where the origins of national Bolshevism in Russia come from. It's not a, uh, it's not, it's, it doesn't come from a fascist movement. It comes from uh, this faction of the white guard that left the Soviet Union, um, or well, left Russia towards the, uh, towards the end of the, so well, during the so Civil War they left, and this faction formed towards the end of the Civil War. Um, and a lot of them came back to the Soviet Union, actually, and, you know, lived normal lives. Some of them ended up, uh, you know, being tried for espionage, though, and landed in, in prisons as well. But, you know, again, it's, it's a super complicated issue when you're talking about the, uh, the white diaspora that was fighting the Bolsheviks and, you know, them coming back and the Soviet government trying to weed out spies from the people who actually wanted to come back and everything. Um, and actually, uh, Lenin even talked about these people. He said the uh, Smen, uh, Smen oh, um, I forgot how to say it, Smena Vichovtsi. Yeah, I wrote it in English here. That's why it's, I can't read Russian words when they're in English. It's super difficult. Only when they're in the Russian Cyrillic letters. But anyway, they express, Lenin said that they expressed the moods of thousands of various bourgeois or Soviet collaborators who are the participants of our new economic policy. So, you know, the Bolshevik party looked upon them uh, to a certain degree favorably. They didn't want to let them in the communist party because they knew like their ideology was not compatible with uh, dialectical materialism, but they worked with them in political alliances when, you know, in terms of strengthening the Soviet state and uh, in the 1920s enacting the new economic policy. Uh, so 
uh, the, this, is, this is where national Bolshevism in Russia basically comes from. And the reasons for why the national Bolsheviks decided to support the Soviet government are pretty much the same uh, values that the neo-Eurasianists, uh, that, that are important to the neo-Eurasianists uh, when it, in in regards to communism, in regards to where the like communists can find common ground with these people, um, it's you know because like like national Bolshevism, neo Eurasianism doesn't support communist ideas, but it supported the Soviet Union because it views uh, I mean it supported the Soviet Union. It views the history of Soviet accomplishments and its leaders favorably, and in practice, it supported progressive anti anti imperialist causes. Like, that's another thing. We should, we really also got to look at the practical impact that um, neo-Eurasianists and uh, people who subscribe to Dugan's ideas have made. In 2014, when the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics decided they were not going to um, be part of a, a country that's run by a fascist-backed coup d'etat, uh, with these people, they, 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 declared independence, they raised Soviet flags, they started reorganizing May Day celebrations, they gave all this power to the trade unions of the of the People's Republics of Lugansk and Donetsk. They were like, we are proud of our Soviet history and we're going to defend it. And you know, you know who were some of the first people to go there and actively support them? Like, like join the ranks of the um, people's militias of these places and send humanitarian aid and send money? It was Dugan and his family and his supporters and these neo-Eurasianists. They were there from the beginning. And uh, I remember when the first time when uh, the first time I went to Lugansk and Donetsk in 2016, I think it was, I remember I met people in the people's militias and tons of them were like self-described monarchist neo-Eurasianists. The, the people's militia, for those who were not just like you know, picking up arms to defend their home, who were just apolitical. All the political, all the politicized people in the military there were either communists or neo-Eurasianists. And this is like, uh, it, it, sound, it kind of sounds strange to hear that people who are calling themselves neo-Eurasianists or monarchs are fighting alongside communists, but this is like the political reality here. Like they, the neo-Eurasianists are a real anti-imperialist force. Their ideas might not be compatible with uh, the the philosophy of, or their their philosophy might not be compatible with the Leninist philosophy. But that doesn't mean that there can't be any sort of political cooperation. On the on the contrary, I think there needs to be because they are a very, um, they're they're a very significant anti-liberal force and anti-imperialist force. Uh, in Russia and in other places in the world. They also uh, uh, work with other anti-imperialist communist parties around the world, like in Turkey. Uh, and they're, they're fiercely anti-NATO as well. So that pretty much ties into the conclusions to what I wanted to make, um, the, the conclusions I wanted to make about this entire thing. Uh, the main thing is that there are philosophical ideas, metaphysical philosophical ideas, of course, cannot be reconciled with um, with the uh, Marxist Leninist materialist ideas, right? Materialism and metaphysics are antitheses. Um, you know, also I, you know, they, they, they also focus a lot on religion. The, the, the Russian Orthodox church is very, uh, important to, uh, the neo Eurasianists as well. Whereas for communists, like this is considered a personal, a personal, um, it's considered, considered your personal business, whatever religion you are. Um, and that's because we're materialists again. But again, just to reiterate, this doesn't mean we should oppose them. Uh, because the prime contradiction now, the way I see it, is imperialism. And they're against it, you know. And they also view, pri uh, you know, prominent communist figures and the history of communist countries favorably. So I think they're, politically, they're, they're, you know, fine allies to have. Just, uh, we disagree on philosophical stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, let's get to some questions. Also, comrades, if, uh, if you like the live and you like the channel, if you want to throw us some super chats, that'd be nice. But uh, I'm still going to 
answer your questions even if you don't give us money. <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm going to go through the comments now. Are the questions. Put your questions in the chat and I will get to them. Let's see. Pablo Popova, were they religious? I'm guessing you're think you're talking about the uh, Smena. Uh, what are they called again? I can never remember their name. Smena Vechovci. Yeah, yeah. They uh, a lot of them were religious. Yeah. The practicing of religion is materialist. It's the philosophy of religion that's idealist. That that's a that's a good point. Yeah. Do I think Juche is an update of Marxism-Leninism? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I would say it's an update, but I definitely think it's made its uh, Juche has made a unique contribution to Marxism-Leninism. I think uh, the main the main contribution it's made has to do with the idea of self-reliance. Yeah. What will come after full global communism? I don't know. <laughs> That's like asking uh, someone living in like primitive communist society or slave society what communism is going to look like. They won't even know what communism is. We're we're uh, we're confined to our historical period and what we can predict. You know, I don't know. What, I mean, communism will be the end of class society, and so you know, communism will be the end of class society in general. What's going to come after that? I don't know. What's my opinion about Daria Dugana? Uh, she did great work, you know. Um, she, I knew her personally, and she was also uh, in Donbass many times, uh, doing a lot of great work there. I mean, she was assassinated because she was exposing the fact that there were Nazis, neo-Nazis in Azovstal, uh, when it was after it was cleared out. So um, she also did a lot of great journalistic work. And uh, I, I knew her personally. She was a wonderful woman. Question. Why is the music in your documentaries always so loud? Can, can, sorry. Uh, I think uh, I, I've, I've mastered toning them down a bit. So if you watch our uh, more recent stuff, I, I promise the music isn't going to bother you. Also, if you if you watch the documentary and you were, ups, were upset about the music, there's an abridged version now, and uh, the music is completely uh, fixed. Marxism, Leninism, Zoomerism. Do you think a union between right-wing and left-wing forces in the West is necessary as long as they are anti-NATO? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think there's. It's it's. I think yeah, it is necessary. But again, this doesn't mean that we obviously Marxist-Leninists need to organize into political organizations that uh, have you know strict organizational and party discipline. Um, you know, right wingers should not be allowed into that. The we're we're stronger in numbers, so we need the 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 whole problem with the Marxist Leninist movement in the West is that we're all splintered into different parties. That's another thing we we need to fig figure out how to uh, put an end to that. <clears throat> Can you please make a video debunk the Soviet famine of 1932? You could watch. Uh, we have a video about that. About uh, it's called Holodomor. You can if you if you search Holodomor on our channel, you'll see it. How do you keep the right wingers in line after the revolution? Um, well, again, 
it de it depends it, it's like a totally it's like a totally fluid situation you don't know you, you can't predict what people are going to do after a revolution not ev not all the right wingers are going to be like we don't like what you're doing nihilistic guy asks about 110,000 russians uh, having been killed in the special military operation, true or false? Uh, I don't think that's true. What are your thoughts on MAGA communism? I'm going to answer this, these two things together. What are your thoughts on MAGA communism? And uh, have you read anything on infrared uh, substack on MAGA communism? Um, I've read, I read like half of the substack. I need to read the rest of it. And... Uh, so I'm not sure I can give a 100% educated um, response to that question, but I think the idea that we need that we need to like uh, form a political some sort of political coalition with uh, you know Trump supporters that feel betrayed with, by the Republican Party I think it's a great idea. Um, how to exactly do that I don't know. Maybe maybe it says that in at the at the second half of Haas's Substack I don't know. I, d I wasn't able to read it. I watch I watch Haas sometimes. I really liked what he did uh, <laughs> trolling the CPUSA <laughs> in the Zoom call, because I also think uh, I, I also think the the, the CPUSA is like r ridiculous. What lesson should Western Marxist-Leninists in the Imperial Corps take from Dugan? Uh, I think I think the the lesson we should take from Dugan, to be honest, and is is that I think I think we the main lesson, in my opinion, is that we should not think that traditionalism is in contradiction with Marxism-Leninism in terms of uh, social policy and cultural policy. I don't think these uh, like these issues should even like be at the forefront of uh, communist political programs either. I mean, like so much time is spent on in a lot of leftist groups on what what essentially at this point it wasn't always like this, but at this point a lot amounts to liberal issues like talking about um, you know trans athletes are they able to participate in this or that. Uh, talking about like, I don't know, all, all this stuff connected to sexuality. It's like, it's not, it's, it, this stuff is not uh, critical to the, the advancement of the Marxist-Leninist movement. And it's something that no other communist party in the world is, uh, is, is really paying that sort of attention to outside of the West. So I think what we should do is understand that like, whether someone's more traditionally oriented or like super into this, I guess, identity politics stuff or cultural politics, this is not like a critical factor in deciding whether or not someone is progressive in terms of the class struggle or not. That's, I think, that's, I think what uh, the main thing we should take away. Like we should not, uh, like we should not, we should not d denounce Dugan because he, he thinks that the, that like the focus on trans issues or something in the West is like ridiculous. That that should not be the the critical moment. <laughs> Haas is kind of a jackass. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, no offense to him, but yeah, <laughs> I think he knows also. We should be against hate crimes. Yeah. What do I think of Dugan's critique of Marxism-Leninism? Well, um, I, I don't know. I don't really know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, if you're not referring to, because I, I already spoke a bit about uh, his critiques of, um, you know, he 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 th sees Marxist-Leninist theory as a dogma. So, I don't I don't really think that I don't think that's correct. I think uh, 
in terms of the, the party for socialism and liberation, um, I mean, I think it's cool that they've expanded so much and that they've like spread the socialist uh, message to a lot of places and they're straight up like Marxist Leninist and everything. But there's a lot of things I don't agree with them on. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be I wouldn't go so far as to become a member of the organization. Yeah, I agree. Tradition should never be imposed. I think this kind of stuff, like, should be handled at, at like, a, like, I mean, in a social society, I think it should just be handled at, like, a, a sort of bu bureaucratic state level. Like, people should decide their preferences in, in elections for stuff like that. It, it, it's, it's, I, I, I think uh, what, what uh, needs to be focused on, really, in terms of, you know, party line and stuff has to be, uh, you know, economic, the, the class war, economic stuff. Are most Russians against or in favor of the special military operation as of 2023? Do they see Russia as winning? If so, what does that mean? Uh, I think s still most Russians are in favor of it, yeah. Um, I think a war, there's a little bit of war weariness, but not really that much. And especially because recently uh, Russian forces made advances in Donetsk and Lugansk. That's uh, kind of uh, made people, you know, a little bit less uh, worried. But I don't know. I think it's very possible Russia is playing a long game on purpose because a lot of these uh, weapons that are getting to the Ukrainian military are being destroyed immediately. It's very possible that uh, this is a strategy in itself of the Russian military to grind down these, the weapon stockpiles of NATO that are getting there. And a lot of them are being used, but a lot of them are being instantly destroyed. And then those that are being used are getting destroyed as well. It's costing NATO an arm and a leg. And I think uh, it, it's, it, it's possible, and I don't think this was Russia's initial strategy. But I think Russia may have changed its strategy to this, uh, basically pl playing a war of attrition with NATO's uh, weapon supplies. What was the main reason I left the US? It's because I, uh, I wanted to read about socialism from uh, Soviet sources in Russian. So I majored in Russian language and literature, and I also had another major in history and I went to Rutgers University. So I had like, after four years, I had a basic understanding of Russian and I was like, what am I gonna do with my life? And I said, why not go to Russia to improve my language level and then try to see what happens. And I found a cool job and I started this YouTube channel. So it's worked, life just kind of worked itself out that way. Right. Is it hard to get a work visa to live in Russia? No, not at all, not at all. You could find work on the internet. You could like be, find, look up, if you want to move to Russia, Google like English, English schools in Russia and a huge list will come up and you could get your foot in the door working as like an English teacher. You really don't need uh, very much experience. You don't need any experience. You could just, uh, you could just get like a, a certificate. That's how I got to Russia. And then I just changed my work. I don't think uh, a Russian, I don't think there is a th an existential threat of a Russian failure in Ukraine. Um, I think all it has to do, like, it's only a matter of time before Russia is victorious. I think it's just, uh, and NATO knows that. Uh, Ukraine, I think, from the beginning has been desperate uh, to change that situation. But, I mean, NATO's goal has been to give, try to give Russia as bloody a nose as it possibly can. I don't think its goal was ever to actually win the conflict, although they say that they say they want to. But uh, so, yeah, I don't think it's an existential threat to Russia and China. But anyway, comrades, uh, I'm going to end it here. All right. So because uh, we're, we're just about at, at an hour now. But uh, thank you all for joining us in the chat that this was uh, an analysis of Alexander Dugan's ideas that he put forward in the interview with, that we did with him on the channel. 
So make sure if you haven't seen the interview already and you don't understand some of the stuff that I was referencing in this uh, live stream, make sure to check out the interview. The link is the first message in the chat. And after you watch it, leave a comment, like, subscribe, and uh, help us out by becoming a member on Patreon as well, because we're actually expanding our operations. We're not just a YouTube channel, uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know. We also have a website, the-revolution-report.com, where we have we uh, republish a lot of articles by people like Caitlin Johnstone and stuff from Midwestern Marks, really good analytical articles from places like that. But we also have our own correspondents that write, um, you know, in the, that write exclusive pieces for the Revolution Report. One we have recently is uh, actually part one of a series that Slava, the Ukrainian socialist, is going is writing on the fall of the Soviet Union. She's writing an analysis on that. So, um, you know, we've got bills to pay to keep the servers up and everything. And if you become a member on Patreon, that would be a huge help to us as well. So I don't got to pay out of my pocket to uh, keep everything going. But yeah, so uh, definitely check out our website, check out our Telegram. We have a Telegram uh, channel as well. Um, it's really cool. And uh, we're trying to get the amount of members we have on that up as well. We put updates about what we're doing on the channel, uh, on the website, and uh, some of my personal political commentary and philosophical commentary that is there as well. So once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us and uh, workers of the world unite. And we'll see you on the next live stream or video.